As I mentioned earlier, our speaker for the chapel this morning is the speaker that we have for the pastor's conference, Dr. Ross Hastings. Dr. Hastings, why don't you come forward? Uh, Ross is the, uh, has been a pastor. In fact, I think you, you and Mike Richardson pastored on a team together, right? We did. And Mike's sitting in the back uh, in the quest room there. Uh, Dr. Hastings is now presently uh, at Regent College as a associate pastor, or, uh, associate professor of pastoral theology at Regent, and I've got a list of classes that you teach, apparently. Okay. Is that okay to tell them that? Sure. Trinitarian theology, preaching, pastoral care and ethics, and the theology and spirituality of mission and missional churches. Uh, you'll notice, maybe by a bit of an accent, that Ross spent some early time in South Africa. No? no? Scotland. Scotland. Yes. Why did it say South Africa? That was in later life. Okay. Yeah. Later life. Okay. But he does enjoy things like, now is this right? Rugby? Mm -hmm. Cricket? Yes. I've never understood that game. Oh. Uh, squash and soccer. So there you go. You're married to Tammy? I am. I've got a few things right. There we go. <laughs> and we're thankful you're here. Thanks, Doug. Uh, why don't we pray together? <laughs> Lord, thanks so much for the fact that uh, Ross is here with us to share from your word, not only this morning in chapel, but in other sessions during the day. And we just thank you for his heart, his passion, his love for you, and uh, his ability to open your word to us now. And so we ask that your spirit would allow him and empower him to share what you've laid on his heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much, Doug, for the welcome. And uh, it's great to be with you. Good to reconnect with Mike and with others that I know here. Uh, Stacy and Andrew, are you here? No? Yeah. Hey, some of the uh, Regent alums. And uh, I look forward to meeting some of you after this. And uh, look forward to also to seeing some of you at Regent when you're done here at Columbia. Um, just, just a small hint. Um, yes, I want to speak to you today on this topic, don't lose heart moral formation and ethical decision-making in a fragmented culture. Um, actually, that's the title for the whole, the whole day. I'm not going to cover all of that with you. I wanna, I wanna, if you have a Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 with me. <clears throat> the key phrase that God laid upon my heart for today, which I hope will encourage you, is 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1. I'm going to read a few verses in the context before we uh, read that verse. So chapter 3, verse 4, such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything from ourselves, for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Down to verse 12, therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Down to verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Therefore, since we have this ministry, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. And down to verse 16, where Paul repeats the phrase, therefore we do not lose heart. Heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. This is the word of the Lord. So when I talk about ethics today, I mean all of this. Moral formation, how we're formed, ethical decision making, and then ethical action. All of those things. God is apparently interested in what we do as well as what we are. This is the force of Christian ethics. And with regard to this whole area of the Christian life right now, it would be easy, I think, for all of us to lose heart. We can lose heart because of our own struggles with the pursuit of righteousness, and we could also lose heart with where the church is in this regard, 
and we could also lose heart because of the battles that we are waging with the outside world. Um, the battle for Christian ethics is really on. We are, as an evangelical culture, I think, reaping the consequences of a gospel without ethics, of easy believism, hyper graceism, antinomianism, the idea that law is not part of the gospel. And we're losing that battle, I think, on all kinds of fronts. So take in-house in the church. The very public case just erupted last week with a prominent Seattle pastor, mostly about the abuse of power, which will again hurt the witness of the Christian church. Um, which leads me to tell you that I, I teach a lot about the integrity and ethics of pastors. Um, if you are going to be a pastor, can I recommend a book that you absolutely cannot afford not to read? That sounds like a double or triple negative or something like that. Um, but uh, The Betrayal of Trust by Grenson Bell. Around 10% of pastors will fall morally, usually sexually, and often as a result of inner brokenness, relational loneliness, and it is always a breach of power. There are no, there's no level playing field in the pastorate with pastors and people in the congregation. It's always person in power and a person who is not in power. And, um, and we are losing, it seems to me that the, the extent of that is also a great struggle. And then I think about outside the church on a number of fronts. A week, um, a week ago, we had a guest lecture in our pastoral ethics course at Regent, Margaret Cottle, uh, who is a, a palliative care physician, also on the Euthanasia Prevention Coalition. She stated in her lecture that despite all efforts, uh, Canada, following countries like Holland and Belgium, is well on its way to legalizing euthanasia for anyone who wants it. So we will, as a society, be giving tacit agreement and use of our tax dollars to agree with people that their lives are not worth living and that they and not God has the last say. And then, of course, very fresh uh, is the whole experience of the Trinity Western Law School case. I happen to be blessed to be speaking to the Christian Lawyers, uh, Christian Legal Fellowship in Whistler just two weekends ago, and uh, those leading the charge in this area were not optimistic about a good outcome, and it turns, it, tur it turns out they were right. I find it stunning that there's such anti-Christian sentiment in our country, and that there's a willingness to override a piece of legislation concerning religious freedoms that is at the heart of basic human rights of a liberal democracy, a right, rights given to Canada by the Christian church. This is the irony. Well, Paul, in the context of ethics, says we do not lose heart. It is easy to lose heart. Actually, it does remind me of cricket, Doug. Um, you, know, you may think that cricket is you know, a bit of a wimp sport. It's anything but. In cricket, you face a ball coming at you at 90 miles an hour, and it's a harder ball than a baseball. I hate to break it to you baseball players. And when I played, there was no such thing as a helmet. I got hit twice in the head playing cricket. That probably explains a lot. Um, but um, and you go out to bat in the middle of the pitch. You only get one chance, not three. Um, and when a bowler is bowling that fast, you really it's instinct. You play as he bowls, and you just hope that you're playing in the right direction. And if he drops it short and it bounces up, you're toast. Um, and then if you are out, you have to walk 100 yards in front of the whole, you know, the whole audience and look very shamefaced. And, you know, I've thought about this whole thing of engaging in ethics is a little bit like batting in cricket. Um, we, are, we, we are taking it on all sides. As someone concerned with my own personal holiness, as someone concerned about the personal holiness of the people of the church, as someone concerned about the holiness and the ethics of pastors, as someone concerned about how we are speaking into the public square as Christian people. By the way, we do need to do that. We can speak on, the, on we must speak in evangelical gospel ways. Uh, what God has in mind for society based on his laws is, is good. It brings shalom. But we need to teach it that way rather than raise our heads every time there's an ethical challenge and uh, call down judgment on people. So it is easy to lose heart. It's also easy, easy to lose heart because of the battle and the fierceness of the battle. I think it's also easy to lose heart because this is an area in Christian theology with such ideological confusion. Some are unconcerned about morality and are frankly surprised that a gospel of grace should say anything about ethics 
And they wrongly use Martin Luther, Karl Barth, to assume justification in Christ means that I, I don't have to, it doesn't matter how I live. I was reading just this week in Revelation chapter 19 that at the marriage supper of the Lamb, the people of God, the bride adorned for her bridegroom is wearing fine linen, and that fine linen is, represent, represents the, the righteous acts of the people of God. Yes, we're righteous in Christ. Yes, we are justified. But apparently if you are one with Christ and you're in union with Christ, you're not only justified, you're also being sanctified. And your character and your life is being transformed. And there will be righteous acts that will then bring pleasure to Jesus when you see him. Acts of social justice, perhaps. Acts of personal righteousness. Acts of compassion. And so there's, there's a great deal of confusion in that regard. Uh, secondly, it's easy to lose heart because this area also seems to be an area of great failure in the contemporary church. Um, Reggie McNeil puts it this way. He says, what you do is what you believe. Everything else is just religious talk. So it's what you do that really counts. That shows what you believe. Everything else is just religious talk. Ethics, what, the thing I want to get across to you today and, and encourage you in is that ethics must be grounded in the gospel. It must be evangelical ethics with a small e, if it's proper ethics. But if we as evangelicals must be evangelical in our ethics, that is gospel motivated, we must also be people of ethics. Ethics counts. Ethics matters. Who we are as the people of God and holiness, what we do by way of justice and righteousness, it really does matter. The third reason around this, the, ideolo the ide ideological difficulties is that so little is taught in Christian institutions on ethics. Now, I think about my own institution. We do now teach two courses in ethics. We used to teach one a long time ago, but for a long time, no nobody taught ethics. Bible colleges, seminaries, not many courses on ethics. Now, sometimes that's for good reasons. Somebody like Karl Barth didn't write a lot on ethics separately from his theology because he said theology and ethics go together. Gospel and ethics must always go together. And if that's the case, we're okay. Ethics should be intertwined and ensconced in Christian theology. Sometimes I fear that we neglect it uh, altogether. And fourthly, ideologically, we struggle with this um, because when it comes to ethical action, there isn't a rule book. And I teach pastors in this area of pastoral ethics, and this is difficult stuff. You know, you were asked all the time about things like cloning, or your couple, couples were dealing with in, in vitro fertilization. On what basis will you answer those questions? And what I'd like to be able to give all my students in pastoral ethics is, here's the rule book. But is that the way to do ethics? It's been called casuistry on the basis of cases. Now, precedent can help, but the truth is, this is meant to be a challenging area. And the reason it's challenging is that there is no rule book, but you as a person ensconced in the person of Christ, seeking the direction of the Holy Spirit, being formed by spiritual practices over the years, being fully informed by the word of God and at all that, all that it says about a particular matter, and with consultation from the wider community of the people of God, you can make decisions with confidence because of all those resources. And that's why I do not lose heart. Let me suggest there are three reasons in this short text that give us reason to have hope actually to be defiant. Paul is talking about uh, false teachers who had uh, poor ethics, his own life, which he says is honestly one of openness, transparency. Um, and he says, in the midst of this, we do not lose heart. For somebody in the Christian church to say today with regard to ethics, we do not lose heart, it, it's pretty defiant language. It's defiant language. I mean, you know the struggles of your own heart. You know, I sometimes think, I, I, you know, I'm all for forming a strong understanding and doctrine of why homosexual practice is wrong for Christian people. But I find a profound hypocrisy in the fact that in most of our congregations, 60 to 70% of our heterosexual men are watching pornography. Something, something doesn't add up with that. All of this must come under the light of God. It's deeply discouraging to be in the pastorate in these days for these reasons. But Paul says we do not lose heart. 
Winston Churchill is one of my favorite leaders of all time, and uh, he was defiant. When I read this in Paul, We Do Not Lose Heart, my mind immediately went to Churchill when he said, we shall never surrender. Even though large tracts, this is a speech, even though large tracts of Europe and many old and famous states have fallen or may fall into the grip of the Gestapo and all the odious apparatus of Nazi rule, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight them on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight on the fields and in the streets. We shall fight on the hills. We shall never surrender. And even if, which I do not for a moment believe, this island or a large part of it were subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. Notice the use of repetition in his oratory. Paul's doing something similar twice. In one, one passage, we do not lose heart. On what basis is Churchill so defiant, so sure that Britain will not fail? He was a believer in God, could have been that. Um, he was a believer in British grit. Perhaps he was also a believer in American kindness when he needed it. But I'm more interested in what's behind Paul's defiance. Why does Paul say we do not lose heart? And there are three reasons, and these just happen to be the very core of Christian ethics. Christ, covenant, and community. Christ, covenant, and community. Since through God's mercy, that's where he begins, ethics is first of all about a response to the mercy of God expressed in the self-giving of God in Christ. And so Paul says in chapter 3 verse 4, such confidence we have, how? Through Christ before God. So it's through Christ we have the new covenant and it's through Christ that we have um, any hope of even being in the game, if you like. And in the context of the new covenant, Paul explains there's three dimensions to the new covenant. I will be your God and you'll be my people. That's we belong to God. Secondly, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. And thirdly, I will put my laws in your hearts. And by your spirit, I will enable you to fulfill Christian ethics. And it's on the second one that we can first of all rejoice. You see, everyone, as we pursue ethics, know that we're failing constantly. And evangelical ethics is this. Christ has succeeded where you failed. Christ has become one of us to act representatively for us. He said, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. And he acted out in his obedience to the Father and we are represented in him. And as a result of that, we are justified before him. And as a result of that, we also can begin to be sanctified before him because our union with Christ makes, it's this is the great doctrine that John Calvin taught, union with Christ has two graces associated with it, justification and sanctification. You're made righteous before God and you're being made holy by your union with Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit who enables you to live into your union with Christ. So how does Paul gain a sense of hope in the midst of this battle for his own personal holiness and for the people of God and for leaders in the people of God? Number one, it is through Christ. It's our being in Christ and Christ being in us. 1933, Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously insisted that theology should give primacy to the who question over the how question. In, in ethics, we want the how question. God gives us the who question. The implication, says Alan Torrance, uh, the implication was that it is only as we know who God is that we know how we ought to live. Ethical obligation requires to be understood in light of God's engagement with humanity in Christ. In other words, the ought is grounded in the is, who we are in Christ, who Christ has been for us, who he is for us today at the right hand of the Father. 
and then the Holy Spirit who's at work in us. And, and Paul actually brings out two aspects of our relationship with Christ in this passage. Number one, our communion with the person of Christ. And secondly, our contemplation of Christ. Chapter 3, verse 18, which is directly before our great passage, all we who with unveiled face reflect or contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And then he says, therefore, since through God's mercy um, we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. It's because of Christ, who he is for us and who he is in us, and the fact that we have the privilege of looking into his face. Second Corinthians makes a point of talking about the face of Christ that we must contemplate. How do you grow in Christian holiness? How do you grow in moral formation? By gazing on the person of Christ. How do you do that? You do it when you go to church and you hear the word of God preached. You do it when you read the word of God personally. Both are important. Can I say that hearing the word of God preached is more important than actually reading it personally? Because it's communal, something happens. We are very individualistic in our culture. We're all about our own personal spiritual disciplines. God's interested mostly in what happens in the church. Paul is profoundly ecclesial. The 17th century Church of England Bishop Jeremy Taylor comments on uh, attendance at temple worship by Mary and Joseph and, and goes on to say this, that in public solemnities, God opens his treasures and pours out his grace more abundantly. Private devotions and secret offices of religion are like, ref are like refreshing of a garden with the distilling and petty drops of a water pot. But addresses to the temple and serving God in the public communion of the saints is like rain from heaven. For religion is a public virtue. It is the ligature of souls. Um, so I'm telling you that Christ is our only hope. Communion with him, in contemplation of him, through the word, through the Eucharist, through communion together, through our personal practices, God's mercy expressed Christologically. Secondly, um, the covenant. And the whole context here is the new covenant. And all I want to say to you, um, because my time is up, is that the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit works to enable us to live out the new covenant the law has been placed on our hearts, which tells me, by the way, there is a place for the Decalogue in Christian ethics. Don't think the Ten Commandments don't have value. But understand the covenantal context. When God says to the people of Israel, you shall have no other gods before me, and gives me the Ten Commandments before he says anything about what they ought to do, he tells them who he is. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, and he tells them he's redeemed them. In other words, the Ten Commandments weren't given so that we must do them, they were given so that we could get to do them as people living out life in Christ. And thirdly, um, this secret, this great secret of Paul's confidence, he says, we do not lose heart. First because, or first because of Christ, second because of covenant, and third because of community together. Notice Paul's pronouns in this text. They're all we pronouns. Uh, verse 12 of chapter 3, therefore since we have such a hope, 3 verse 18, and we all who with unveiled face. And then in the, the two verses we've looked at as being repeated, Paul says, therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Every bone of Paul's body is ecclesial. There is room for persons, but persons need to be in relation. And it's our ecclesial life together that enables us to be strong. And it's from strong communities that we can portray as an alternative to our society of what humanity really looks like, that we can begin to speak with some authenticity. We must speak in the ways of Christ. We must speak in covenantal ways, in ways that are gospel-oriented. And we must speak from communities that demand an explanation. Are you part of a Christian community that demands an explanation? Some of us go to church. We need to be the church and be so radical in the way we are church that we will make a difference. We do not lose heart.